Okay, I'm gonna open the server. This meeting is being recorded. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that you have given us to just come together in fellowship as Christians and um, try to learn a little bit more about scripture, a little bit more about what we call the Bible. We've come to understand, Holy Father, that uh, there are some differences between where we are in our time here in the 21st century and what was going on in the biblical times. And we're trying to connect the dots by the power of your Holy Spirit. Uh, so indeed, give us discernment, Father. Give us the ability to understand better, more efficiently, thus saith the Lord, so we can apply to our lives and by the power of your Spirit, uh, come closer to being what you have called us to be, what you have destined us to be. It's, of course, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we have access to you. And so we ask this blessing in his name. Amen. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. And uh, there we go. Okay. I'm guessing everyone can see that okay. Hey, Nikki has made uh, an appearance. Hello, how are you? Uh, my daughter is on. She will be the Mimi character. She's listening to us. She's actually uh, taking this class at Dallas Christian as we speak. Um, so uh, it's good to have her on. Now, I know that there was one scenario uh, uh, as I taught this class, I've used um, more than one edition, if you will, of it. So there was some discrepancies there. And I do apologize for that. Uh, for those who uh, was trying to find the answers to the questions and they theoretically was supposed to be in chapter one, but they were in chapter two. So if that impacted you in any way, I do apologize for that. The reason that it happened is because, um, again, different editions of the text. Uh, I've taught it using edition two. I've taught it using edition three of uh, grasping God's word. Uh, and also... When the class was taught, um, I guess at the college level, it was done in six weeks. And of course, I didn't want to have you do that much work. So I split it in half. So it literally takes two weeks to do uh, one segment of the course. So those are the two reasons that that took place. So I definitely appreciate your patience. Uh, and those of you who did the assignments, who turned them in to me. Um, I was careful to to uh, communicate to you and get them back to you. So uh, if I did not send you back your assignment, I guess it's because you didn't give me one. Okay, But I did allow students to determine um, if they would write or not. Um, so if you are choosing to go through the course just by listening, then of course, that is that is your choice. So. Before I go on, give me a thumbs up that you can hear me okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So how to study Bible lesson two. Let's go. Uh, introduction to interpretation. Uh, these are the things that we um, talked about um, this week or read about this week as it relates to um, the coursework, the syllabus. Um, so if you had any questions about them. Uh, the things we looked at, and you will have the opportunity to, to ask them here in this context. Uh, but this particular PowerPoint um, will actually go over some of the things that we that we considered this week. So if there are questions there, you might uh, be able to get your answers here coming up. Now, before we can try to apply passages of biblical scripture to ourselves, we must first consider what, if anything, separates us from the biblical audience. Um, it's 2022 for another four weeks. Then it'd be 2023 if God says the same. The New Testament was written in the first century. You know, we believe that Paul himself, for instance, 
died in the 60s AD uh, after about a 20 year or so ministry. So that was 2000 years ago that the, the letter to the Romans, for instance, was written. Now we start talking about the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. It was even longer. Uh, there were 400 years between the close of the Hebrew Bible and the opening of the uh, the New Testament. Um, and if you go back earlier than that, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, uh, we come to believe that uh, the, the, the Pentateuch, the Torah, was written sometime when Moses was in the wilderness, assuming Moses is the writer. And uh, the Hebrew writers believe that he was. So somewhere in that circle, those 40 years that they were walking around in circles, Moses penned the law. So you're talking about over 3,000 years ago to that end, customs, uh, cultures, languages, situations, uh, time, as it relates to the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, there's just differences. And between the Old and New Testament, there's also a different covenant, how God got at the Jews pre-Jesus and how God uh, deals with the people today is different. Uh, so there's even a covenantal difference between us and them. That is why it's important that we uh, try to flesh out what did, it what did it originally mean and what does it mean now? And Duval and Hayes does a real good job of talking about these things. The first thing we dealt with, and you wrote, wrote about it in your essays, was grasping the text in their town. In other words, what did the text mean to the biblical audience? Um, in our day and time, you know, how, how a, an American uh, sees certain things in New York and how we see it in, in Texas different, or how someone on the west side sees it might be different from how someone sees it on the east side, uh, how someone in another nation sees a thing versus how we see it in our nation different, how one gender sees a thing versus how another gender sees a thing. There's going to be differences there. Um, how much more uh, is it important for us to understand what the biblical audience meant? Um, I communicated to the class last week. Uh, the Bible wasn't written to us. You know, when Paul wrote the letter to the Romans, he literally wrote it to those who were in Rome. That's actually in the text. So that lets us know he didn't have you and me in mind. And, and we have to have enough humility to understand that. Um, if we're going to ever begin to understand how what Paul wrote to the Romans applies to us, then the first thing we're going to have to understand, well, what did it mean to them? That's the first uh, part of, of really un unraveling or grasping exactly how we should see it. We have to understand how they saw it. Um, so what did the text mean to the audience? Here's some examples. Uh, two examples I will give in this, in this lesson, this lecture. Number one, Genesis chapter six, Noah's Ark. Um, there's a mindset out there that says, hey, everything in the Bible we're supposed to follow. That's why I mentioned Noah's Ark. Uh, there is no di a directive uh, for me as a man of God to build an ark. I, I do not have to go find a gopher wood tree. I don't have to pitch it inside and out with pitch. I don't have to spend the next 120 years of my life building that boat because it's going to rain one day. My God was not talking to me. God was talking to Noah. Um, so when we start trying to apply scripture, we have to determine, does this even apply to me? What about 1 Timothy chapter 5? That's a little closer to us, right? This is uh, a New Testament scripture, 1 Timothy. It was written by Paul to Timothy. Timothy is the pastor uh, in Ephesus. So we know where he pastored. We know who wrote it. Uh, 2,000 years ago, it's still not as far back as going to over three or 4,000 years ago. So that seems a little closer. So when Paul tells Timothy, hey, drink no longer wine, but drink water for your stomach's sake. Does that mean I have to drink wine? Is that the, uh, the directive? If there's some type of theological principle that says I have to drink wine? Well, of course, the answer is no. There's an occasion. There's something going on within Timothy that Paul is directing. There is no theological principle that says, I have to drink wine. Uh, that's the important understanding of grasping the test in their town. 
to understand that God was preparing Noah for a flood, uh, to, for us to understand that Paul was telling Timothy he had a stomach problem. That's the text in their town. That's what they were dealing with. We have to understand that before we can even begin to consider step two in the process, measuring the width of the river to cross. What differences exist between their situation and my situation? I say me, but I need you to put yourself in that context. Um, I'm, I haven't been called to build a boat. God is not going to destroy the world with water. Okay. Uh, his promise is next time you destroy the world, it's going to be a little hotter than water. Um, and an ark wouldn't help that at all. Also, when it came to Timothy's situation, um, they didn't have purified water when Timothy was on the earth. Um, they drank water out of wells. Okay. And if there was something going on in Timothy, then drinking the fermented wine will probably be a little bit better uh, than drinking water out of a well, okay? So there are some differences there uh, in those two contexts, okay? Differences. See. Yeah, with those. The principalizing bridge. Uh, that's the third thing we talked about. What's the theological principle in the text? Now, in Genesis chapter six, the only theological principle I can come up with is to obey God. Uh, there is no principle that I have to build a boat. Uh, there is no principle that I have to preach 120 years. Those are things that was going on in Genesis six. There is no principle that, hey, it's going to rain one day in the context that it had never rained before because before the flood, it never rained before, according to Genesis. But the theological principle that I can apply is when God says, do something, do it. He wants it done. God told Noah to do a certain thing. So about the only thing that I personally can apply as it relates to Genesis 6 to my circumstance is um, the fact that God told Noah to do something. And we have a responsibility just like Noah did to obey what God has said. Uh, now, there might be another theological principle there. Uh, uh, that's something maybe we can talk about a little bit later when we get into discussion. But that is a theological principle, doing what God has says. When we consider what the theological principle is in the text, what we're doing is looking to, to discover meaning, not create it. Now, that's very important. Um, we can't make the Bible say anything. We're, we're not here to tell the Bible what it says. We're here to listen. Uh, and discern, to understand what the Bible is teaching us. Um, you know, we believe by faith that this is the biblical text. God has chosen to speak to us through the word. So when we go into the word, we're looking to understand what the word is teaching, not for us to tell the word what it says. That's the difference between eisegesis and exegesis, right? Right. Ex is a Greek word that means out. Ice is a Greek word that means in. So eisegesis is when we're taking uh, what's out of the Bible, what's out of the text. We're taking it out and we're applying it. Eisegesis is the opposite. I believe something, I perceive something, and I make the text fit my belief system. No, that's that's not where we are. We're in a place where we're looking to discover the meaning of the biblical text. And from that point, we're looking for similarities. What's similar to their situation and our situation? Principalizing bridge, I dealt with Noah and Timothy. Consult the biblical map. This is where Duval and Hayes um, edition two and three kind of go differently. If you have edition two, then it does not have this fourth um, point this fourth principle. It has four, but this is not the fourth one. Uh, in edition three, the third edition of the book, it actually has this as the, uh, the fourth principle. Um, consult the biblical map. How does our theological uh, principle fit with the rest of the Bible? Um, if we come to a conclusion, uh, if we do some exegetical work, right, if we look to try to understand what a text is getting at, and we make a determination. Well, I believe this is the theological principle. Well, whatever we come up with here in the Bible also has to be the principle here in the Bible. The Bible is not ever going to conflict with itself. 
the Bible is not going to say one thing in Genesis theologically and say a different thing in Timothy theologically. How the cultures did things will vary. Uh, how things are fleshed out vary. The whole point of consulting the biblical map says whatever my perspective that the theology of this text is teaching is going to be in alignment with everything the biblical uh, map teaches. God is not going to argue with himself. That will be counterproductive to his mission. So we have to correlate our theology with the whole of scripture. You know, that's a very uh, good point here. Uh, using the same uh, two examples that I've used throughout this, this lecture, uh, whatever we learn from Noah's Ark has to be something we can apply across scripture. Again, there are really no theological principles that goes across the gambit of theology besides if God says it, do it. That that always fits. Genesis 6, Exodus 1, Revelation 22. Do what God says. That fits theologically across the board. Uh, if you have a stomach ache, drink wine. Does not fit across the board. So that cannot be what the Bible is teaching. That can't be what the Bible is teaching theologically. Uh, Paul told Timothy that. Paul told Timothy that for a reason. But is there a theological principle that I, as a New Testament believer, as a 21st century Christian, have to follow? No, it's not. That was Paul telling Timothy something. There was no theology for me. Not drinking wine because my stomach is hurting. Uh, maybe making a better decision if my stomach is hurting is a theological principle there. But I don't have to drink wine because Paul tells Timothy to drink wine. Last but not least, we have to uh, grasp the text in our town. What does that look like? We ask ourselves, how should individual Christians today apply the theological principle in their lives? What does it look like to us? What's relevant to here, uh, to us? Is everything in the Bible relevant to our circumstance? Uh, no, it's not. And there's no reason for us to think that it is. Again, it takes humility to understand that the Bible was not written, the, the, the human side of it. It was not written with you and I in mind. You know, when God is on Sinai with Moses, right? There in Exodus, he's on Sinai, Mount Sinai, he's, he's, he's talking to Moses, and he gives Moses the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Well, he gave those Ten Commandments to those Hebrew people down at the foot of the mountain. That's literally who he gave it to. Um, Paul makes this argument in the letter to the Galatians, as Paul tells them, this stuff, the law that you're trying to follow, there was already a promise made before that. Uh, this is a promise that God made to Abraham. Now, this is Paul's argument, so try to follow me here. When God gave the Ten Commandments to the Hebrew people, the Ten Commandments was not given to you and me, even though they're sitting right there in Scripture. That's something we have to understand. Um, and the only way we can look at the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and determine, hey, do I follow these things, is theology. Now, the Ten Commandments are good theology. I'm not saying that we shouldn't follow them, okay? I am saying that when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, he gave them to the Jews. And that is exactly what Paul says to the Galatians. So Coleman is not making that up. I am not making that up. Um, so it's real important that we grasp the text in our time. How does this text apply to me? Um, the main reason uh, Christians misunderstand the Bible, the main reason that Christians even disagree on what the Bible teaches is this. We don't understand the context. Um, what we mostly understand about context, again, what were we told? What did mama say? What did daddy say? The church community we grew up in, what were, what were we taught? And if we don't take enough time to study the scripture for ourselves, or uh, even learn other methodology, uh, hermeneutics, homiletics, exegesis, then there's a spiritual salary cap that says, I can't see the scripture any different than how it was presented to me. I can't because I have not allowed the Lord to teach me anything different from what I was already taught. Uh, imagine Paul, okay? Now, Paul's a very religious man. Paul was, he was a rabbi in training. Paul was short. We have reason to believe Paul had memorized the Hebrew Bible because that's what rabbis had to do. When you look at Paul's letters, he's just quoting text. 
I don't think he had scrolls of all 39 documents uh, and the Apocrypha, because Paul does deal with the Apocrypha, especially in the letter to the Romans. But my premise is Paul knew the Bible so well because he studied it that way, yet he still misunderstood Jesus was the Messiah. Even though he was a Jew, even though he knew the Hebrew Bible pretty much from memory, he still misunderstood the theological context of Christos or Messiah. So we can be raised in religion. We can be raised in the church and still miss certain things. So we have to have enough humility to understand that that is the case. The Jews and their religion did not accept Jesus as Messiah. Did not. These five uh, words, uh, I gave them there to you so you can kind of look at the key words to the five points. When we're grasping the text in our town, we're observing, okay? When we're measuring the width of the river to cross, we're, we're noting differences. When we're crossing the principalizing bridge, we're considering similarities. We, we first consider differences, then we consider similarities. Uh, we correlate, we consult the biblical map. You know, I've done a little exegetical work. I think this is what the Bible is saying theologically. Well, once we arrive at that point, then we go and consider the whole of scripture. If this is good biblical theology, then it's going to fit the whole of the scripture, not just this particular text. It's going to fit across the board. And if this doesn't fit theologically with the whole of scripture, then my exegesis is, is probably not accurate. My, my work, I, I need to do some more exegetical work to really um, try to understand what the Bible is teaching here. And then the reverence, grasping the text in our town. How is this biblical text relevant to me? Is this biblical text relevant to me? Again, Genesis chapter six, do I have to build an ark? Do you have to build an ark? No, you don't. Even though there's a record that God told somebody to do it, he was not talking to you. He was not talking to me. He was talking to Noah. He was talking to Noah telling Noah to do a specific thing, specific reason. When God tells the prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute, does that mean every preacher have to marry a prostitute? God, I hope not. God told Hosea to marry, marry a prostitute for a specific reason. He was trying to prove a point to his people. We always have to have enough humility to do our exegetical work if we're going to understand what the Bible is teaching. So right now I'm going to pause because that's the end of my lecture. Um, we're going to do some other work here. We'll take a moment. I'm going to ask you to unmute your phones and talk to me. Uh, questions, comments. Uh, unmute your phones. I'm used to cracking it. <laughs> unmute your uh, Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions or comments at all, uh, please, please let me know what they are. Well, either I'm that good of a teacher or y'all just don't want to talk to me. I mean, I, it's okay if it's the first one. I can I can appreciate that very much. Okay. Hey, Grandma. I think you're pretty good. <laughs> I, you know, uh, I just have to agree with everything that that you've taught here. That's, that's awesome. Um, when he told... Uh, know to build the ark. Yeah, you're right. He, there's nothing for us to do as far as that. But if he tells us to do something, we need to do it just like Noah did. <clears throat> Absolutely. Well, thank you. Appreciate the, the comment. Uh, Nikki, I see that you are muted. Uh oh, two of y'all. Uh, Nikki is kind of frozen, either that or you are sitting perfectly still. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it looks like there. Okay. So look, I should have to stay. Let's see our house can't take two computers at the same time, two different Zoom calls, because she said that's what mine did last week. Oh, okay. Well, y'all might have to, I don't know this for a fact, but y'all might have to share it like Isabel and Stevie. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay. Hey, 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 Didi. Hey. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt everybody, but um, I had a um, 
Um, I don't know. Can you see me? I don't know if you can see me now. But um, I have an appointment, and um, the person I'm having an appointment with, she was actually listening to the class, and she's super interested <laughs> in um, what's what's happening. And I just want everybody to kind of see her and welcome her. Y'all can see her and welcome her. Hello, everybody. Hey, can, see? can they see me? I don't know if they can see. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, I think somebody was waving at me. So um, she's uh, going to request the link and everything. And she wants that she's heard good things and she likes exactly what's been going on, um, what's being said, and all of that. So I just, when y'all see her, just go ahead and welcome her. What is her name? Did you? Shavada. Sorry. Uh, my name is Shavada. 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 Oh. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll love to have you a part of uh, the group. We're all- Thanks for welcoming me. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're a friend of Michelle, you're a friend of Alice, sister. <laughs> all right. Well, I look forward to the next meeting. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> you know what? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm about to mute out. Sorry. No, that's fine. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, okay. Any other questions, comments? Isabel, you good? Okay. All right. Mac, I noticed you are unmuted. Do you have anything? Oh no, I was uh, I was just gonna say that um, um, because we are all on different levels uh, in the Bible and our spiritual walk, uh, I can't really say that it's common sense, but it's kind of common sense to know that God didn't tell everybody to build an ark, and God didn't tell everybody to do this. When we read stuff in the Bible, we have to have a certain discernment to know that when he's talking to us, and when we're just reading a story that happened in the Bible. I agree. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Tasia. Hey. <laughs> All right. So here's your quiz for the day uh, there, uh, how to study the Bible. One of the things that uh, I encourage you to do in your exercises is uh, write down and answer, define any words that you did not. <laughs> so even though I didn't tell you about these specific words, uh, some of you did turn in your assignments, and uh, um, I have a, a knowledge of kind of what people have shared. So, apostle, uh, Stevie, what is an apostle? Well, I can see the next slide, but uh, I'm trying to <laughs> yeah, uh, oh, it's one who, who is uh, not 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 one of the, the original followers, but one who is sent from the Lord to give a message to the people, almost like a, uh, a prophet. No, uh, there, there's, uh, there's a lot there. Uh, apostle, Greek word from apostolos. And it does mean one who was sent to your point, a messenger. Now, angelos is the Greek word for angel and it means messenger as well. So, Angelos is more of a spiritual messenger of heaven and is more of a human messenger, an earthly being, but it gets at one who has apostle. Okay. I need to this thing is really messing with me. I can't give a quiz if y'all can keep cheating. Hey, look like you <laughs> changed. <laughs> <laughs> okay we're right. gonna switch rooms every other week <laughs> <laughs> whatever works absolutely uh, we're supposed to be well christ uh we call him jesus christ why do we call him that what is what are we getting at when we say christ Because he's the Messiah. 
Yes, that's exactly right. Uh, Hebrew is Messiah. Greek is Christos. And they both mean the same thing. The anointed one. The anointed one. So yes, very good. I don't know if grandma stole that from my slide or if she just already knew it. I'm a, I'm gonna say she already knew it. Let's see. I'm gonna do it this way. Congratulations. In your reading, you saw the word congruent. I can't even see a slide. So. Yeah. Congruent means agreeing. If something is congruent to something else, that means it agrees. Right. How about exhort? That's one of those words that we uh, hear about in, in the Bible a lot. Exhort a person, one another. It's like that. Uh, exhort. Uh, exhort means to encourage. 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 Patriarch. That was in our reading. Uh, patriarch is a male ancestor, head of family or tribe. I picked out these words, I think, because when I was uh, doing the study, these are words that I noted that some people just did not know uh, naturally in our culture what they mean, and that's okay. It's all a learning process. Pentecost, this is Acts chapter two. Uh, part of your reading this week was Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost. Uh, what is Pentecost? What are we talking about with Pentecost, anybody? That's like uh, in, in Exodus, that's 50 days after Passover and they received the commandments, but it's also um, a festival where 50 days after Passover, they do the counting of Omer until the harvest. So that's when all the, um, the Israelites would come together to celebrate uh, that special occasion. And it's also obviously when the, the, the Holy Spirit was uh, brought down to the apostles. Very good. Uh, that pente gets at 50. That's that five where it comes from. And uh, as you uh, read this week in Acts chapter two, the doors of the church were first open there on the day of Pentecost for you and Jesus' ascension. Yes. Yeah, some biblical text. Yeah, I think I can probably catch up in one more. Here's one that used to mess with me. Sepulcher. I remember what that one means. A sepulcher relates to a grave or tomb. Sepulcher. Steadfastly. Um, you saw that in Acts chapter 2. They continue steadfastly in Apostles' Doctrine, Fellowship, Breaking Breads, and prayers. Steadfastly to be earnest towards or to persevere. Theology or theological. Uh, that's one of those words that kind of scare us from time to time because we say theology and it sounds very scholarly. It just deals with the study of God or the study of religion or study of faith, things that deal with God. That's what we all say theolo uh, theological or theology. Uh, treatise. A treatise is something said or written, okay? So again, one of your assignments was uh, to keep a glossary. I think one of, one of the students gave me one word in, in their glossary. So uh, I think I responded to them. You know, I try to be positive. So I said, that's nice. 
And then I think I stuck my tongue out at him. So to the person that I wrote that to, that wasn't an accident. When you see a colon and the letter P, that's literally P. So, yeah, I'm sure that you came across more than one word that you did not know the answer to, but it's okay. So uh, let's, uh, before we wrap up, do some describe the situation in the town of X. Stevie, I'm going to ask you to wrestle with this before I wrestle with it a little bit. Uh, Acts chapter one, Acts chapter two, from your memory, give me some uh, in their town context, sir. All right. So this is uh, the second writing from Luke. So he's following up with uh, the gospel and the continuation. So in their town, um, as he was writing it, what was going on was, again, Christ was getting ready to ascend. And he was telling them to stick around, hang around Jerusalem and wait, because this is when they were going to celebrate Shavuot or Pentecost. That's when all the Israelites would come into town, kind of setting it up, setting it up for uh, the first sermon to be spoken, because after they had received the Holy Spirit on that day of Pentecost or Shavuot, um, that's when Peter was able to speak the first gospel or, or uh, preach the first gospel. And so in their town. They were in celebration of, uh, again, receiving the Ten Commandments, something that came from God down to them. And now they're changing it into the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down to them. That's what was going on in, in their town at that time. A festival was happening. Um, they were being obedient to Christ. They watched him uh, ascend into the heavens, and they still continue to carry on and wait uh, for the promise of the Holy Spirit. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to uh, give their view? What was going on in their town? Uh, I don't want to call anybody out. It's it's whoever might want to deal with it. Uh, I have a, a young scholar of mine who unmuted, so I guess Mimi wants some of the smoke. Uh, hey, yeah. Yes, um, little daughter. Give me some in their town situation in Acts? What's going on in their town? Uh, they were also um, worried um, because, you know, Jesus had died. And even though he had uh, shown himself uh, to them, they were worried about the, the coming kingdom. So even though they were obeying the commandment to stay in Jerusalem and wait, there were also uh, many people who were afraid of what was going on because Jesus was this very, very big deal. And then after he was killed, everybody didn't know that, you know, he had risen. So there was this spirit of fear and worried and uh, about persecution from um, the Romans because he was like, oh, okay, well, uh, and uh, the derision and also the religious leaders, you know, it's like Jesus was this big deal. Now he's gone, you know, people probably hadn't, you know, I'm sure people, you know, they have text messages. She wouldn't hear the word that. So there was a lot of anxiety and panic and, and worrying about uh, what was going to happen after the fact. So, yeah. Oh, okay, good. It kind of ended abruptly. I thought maybe you still had some things to say. Uh, good. Absolutely. They were concerned, especially chapter one. They're in the upper room. They I mean... It, Put yourself in their shoes for three years plus. They actually walk with the Son of God, God in the flesh. I mean, can you imagine the the comfort that they had? Hey, can't nobody touch me? There's Jesus, you know. Um, when he was killed, or oh, he allowed himself to be crucified, that radically changed their understanding of of everything. Because even they didn't understand that the Messiah was going to be killed by the by the Romans. They were in a different place in their faith and their understanding. So that was one of the reasons why they, they had the fear that they were still trying to really understand this kingdom thing. Um, by the time Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit fell on them, then they started to see more fully, more richly, more completely what was actually going on in, um, in the mind of God. So look at this. This is how I describe it. Uh, Luke, a Gentile, 
wrote this second letter to Theophilus, a Gentile, to communicate certain specifics that directly supported doctrines that Theophilus had already been taught. The reference is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Okay. Um, now, question. What is the significance of Peter's statement in Acts 2, 15? He notes, this is Peter, for these are not drunk people, as you suppose. Uh, as you could tell, when I wrote this lesson, I, I still employ the King James Version. I don't anymore. But that's why you have it like this. Uh, these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Uh, Steve, you give me some context here. You might already cheat it. That's okay if you did. Love you anyway. I'm, I'm, I didn't see it. Uh, so it was still pretty early in the morning. And at, this is after the Holy Spirit had fallen on them. They were speaking uh, in other languages. Again, remember, there, was, there were uh, other Israelites there. Um, from other regions and so they spoke other languages and, and so they came here and then they hear people speaking in people who didn't speak their language it sounded probably just like babble but those people who spoke uh, that language they knew exactly what they were saying almost said Spanish um, so they were communicating they, they were like man these guys are drunk they're just up there babbling he's like no it's too early for for all that we we are filled with the whole well, he didn't say filled with the Holy Spirit but he was telling the truth and that's when he presented uh, the uh, script from Joel that was being um, not prophesied, but um, being fulfilled. Uh, the spirit came down and he's like, you know, the, the elder, the young men would see visions, old men would see dreams, all that. So that was coming into play. And so they weren't drunk. They were just filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in other languages that others in that crowd could understand and some couldn't. Uh, good. Uh, you look at their context. Uh, Two thirteen, some in Jerusalem thought the apostles speaking in tongues or speaking other languages was a byproduct of intoxication, brought on by their consumption of new wine. New wine referred to wine that was very intoxicating. It had more saccharin in it. In their culture, they did not drink uh, in the day, but waited until night. The third hour of the day is only nine in the morning, and it would not have been customary for them to be drunk. So as you can see, here we have a biblical text, Acts chapter 215, that uh, Peter says a certain thing. Hey, these people are not drunk. It's too early for, us to, for them to be drunk. We don't drink that early in our context. This goes into what's going on in their town. Uh, did we know that the third hour of the day was 9 a.m.? Who knew that? We don't speak that way, but that's how they spoke. Did we know inherently that they didn't drink that early? In America, people get up and start drinking beer. I'm guessing the liquor store might be closed, but we keep it at home. So there's no law in our culture that says you don't drink at that a certain time of the day. So again, this is their town. This is their town. That's why I brought these two things up. Okay. So that's uh, our lesson for the day. I do want to share with you. Uh, give me a second. Share what I want to share. There we go. This is what we share. Can everybody see the syllabus? Give me a thumbs up if you can. Can you see the syllabus right now? Okay, thank you. So this is the assignment for last week. This is week one, Duval and Hayes, one and nine, actually they're chop acts up. So if you have this, oh. this book, uh, you say something, Stevie? I think I heard something. Hey, on my end, you froze. Uh, am I back now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it says something here on my screen as well. Uh, so this is Fia Stewart. So this week we will be in chapters one and two of this book, okay? Now keep in mind, as I stated earlier, that theoretically week one and two was together. I split it up so uh, students in this context just didn't have to do that much work. Uh, what you're gonna do this week, um, Acts three and four, Fia Stewart one and two, your essay questions. What argument in the case for interpretation was most effective and why, okay? You actually get that in chapter one and two of this book. Uh, how do Fee and Stewart propose that you give yourself the best possible start 
toward reading and studying the Bible. But once again, it's it's in here. And how does this compare with your usual study method? Now, that's going to be uh, subjective, meaning your study method historically or what you're doing right now. How does what Fee and Stewart flesh out or unpack compare to what you are doing or have done? Uh, those are your essay questions. That's what you'll turn into me. The journal for the week. What action steps will you take to create an opportunity for yourself in the next month to use skills or ideas you've learned in this class in a group setting? Uh, and you could be real with me. You could be like, I'm going to do this, that, or the other. Or you could be on the other spectrum. I ain't ready yet. I ain't doing nothing. But thanks for asking. How do you want to flesh that out is up to you. And as always, defining in all words that you read that you do not know the definition of. Uh, keep in mind that that part of the assignment is not my way to ridicule you. It's what I'm trying to do in this class is not just teach you basic exegesis. I'm trying to help you develop some healthy study habits. Uh, plenty of you read your Bible on a regular basis. Praise God for you. I thank you for that. Um, but when we read it and even understand it even greater, uh, taking the time to uh, define words, you know, whether we have the King James or the NIV, every now and then we're going to come across some words we don't know, and we'll gloss right over them. That's just telling the truth, okay? God is worth it. Understanding what the scripture says is worth it. Develop the habit of defining those words, uh, taking a moment to really understand the text in their town as much as we can, so we can ask those questions. You know, what are the differences here? What are the similarities here? How does this fit inside the biblical map? And how can I apply this in, in my life today? Understanding every word helps us to do those things. For those who, you know, really get deeper and deeper and deeper in the scripture, uh, start talking about the Greek context and stuff like that. It gives more context. I understand most be believers are not going to go there, and that's fine. I'm just merely saying the more we learn about the original audience, the more we can understand if and how we apply it to ourselves. And that's what's key. Any questions or comments about your assignment for the week or anything uh, yeah, I have some people. Uh, okay, you froze up. Thank you. We did studies this week. I guess, uh, daughter, I know that you did. I think you came and studied at my computer last time I checked, uh, which is fine, by the way. There's some uh, software called Lagos. It's the best biblical software in the world. And um, uh, I have it on my computer. And uh, if you ever want to get into some crazy Bible study, talk to me about Lagos. Uh, it, it gets it gets deep. Uh, any questions, comments at all? Take a moment, unmute your phones. Uh, this is open discussion before we pause our fellowship. Does anybody have anything at all? Thanks for giving us. Says a word to me. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I'll just make a little comment. Um, as Daddy mentioned, I'm in this class um, at Dallas Christian. It's actually called Introduction to Biblical Research. Um, this week, as he uh, said that I, I commented on, we did word studies, and we're actually doing it in Colossians, and it, it helped me understand a part of the word that I didn't even see um, looking at the word raised in uh, the Greek and what it means in, in Colossians uh, chapter two, verse 12. But I'm just saying like, if you ever wanna get that deep into word studies, um, just like thinking about something that you've read a whole bunch of times, it, it really is worth it. I was like, oh my gosh, I never would have saw this if I didn't have this assignment. So it's a blessing. It really is to, to, to dig that deep into it, you know, when you're, when, when you're ready. <laughs> that? I second that. Um, I, I picked up that same habit through this course as uh, uh, looking up words. And, and now 
when I look at something and I, and I go to an interlinear Bible to look at the Greek, I, I just, when I talk about it, I just, it's like coloring in the word with a Greek crayon and you get more out of it. Um, so yeah, I took the course and I, I definitely, yeah, it's a habit that I stick with and I love word studies. You get more out of the text when you do it that way. So. But well, thank you uh, for that. Uh, Stop share here. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a journey. And again, everybody kind of gets in where they fit in. I want everybody to be comfortable here. Uh, but this, as, as I've walked through here and really began to unpack uh, theology and uh, scholarship, it, it's a pretty amazing thing. Everybody hadn't been called to study it on a level that some have been called to study it on. But I promise you, um, it's pretty awesome. We will get into word studies later on in the course. It is something that you will learn. Um, but we'll take baby steps and we'll allow the Holy Spirit to, to lead us. So Demetria, thank you for the comment. And also, um, Stevie, thank you as well. Uh, once again, any other comments or questions uh, about the homework, about anything at all? Hey, Should we attach the journal to the essay if we decide to turn that in, or should, is that something that we should just keep for ourselves? No, you can attach the journal. Uh, the journal is is the way you talk to your professor. That would be me, right? So as you do the essays and then write the journal, you know, we're in discussion with each other, and I'll give comments to to your journal. And you could always give comments back to me. Uh, so yes, that and your glossary, you know. Um, yeah. It's just kind of an accountability partner besides the one to your left right there. He's he's your best accountability partner. But uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if all our hearts and minds are clear, thank you for taking some time on your schedule. Again, I'm gonna try to keep us to an hour uh, each week because I know you have busy schedules. Uh, that you're sacrificing to to uh, be a part of this. So it's a couple of minutes after seven. Uh, Stevie, do me a favor and pray us out. Uh, family, I'll be blessed and uh, love you all. And Lord's willing, I will see you on next Sunday. Brother Stevie. Heavenly Father, again, we are just so thankful, Father, for this time to get into your word and dig deeper, Father God. We pray as we do that, you help us to gain a deeper experience with you, Father God, and enrich our walk with you, Father. We pray that you bless each soul on this line tonight, Father God, and uh, pray that you keep them safe, Father God. Um, we pray again that you keep us safe and, and, and whole until the next meeting. We again thank you for this time of fellowship, and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Blessings, everyone. Keep up the good work. Thank you. See you guys. Love you guys. Good night. Love you guys. Love you. Good night. Good night. See you, ain't she? Good night. Good night. See you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Oh, Tasia. See you, Tasia. All right, we out, bro. All right, Mac. See you, All bro. Right.